Today I'm going to pay, play some clips for you on the uh, banking crisis from experts that I follow, perhaps some that you have not seen or heard from, and give you some different perspectives and what that means for the future. And then I'm going to put a lot of specific practical content here one way specific ways four specific ways that you can reduce your exposure and your risk potentially with your bank and then i will show you how you can get a copy of the bank's rating and the metrics that measure the various uh, aspects of the uh, bank's financials and their operations and then finally i'm going to go into in depth into silver and ways that you can get the lowest cost silver if that's something you want to accumulate. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Rupond. Welcome to my YouTube show. This is uh, March 21st, 2023. So let's start with these. Uh, I got five clips for you. They're brief and they come from different perspectives. Uh, the most recent I got off the uh, internet this morning and it's from John Bloomberg's Jonathan Farrow, who's inter interviewing Mohammed El Arian. And um, Mohammed El Arian points out that the, um, the option that was taken by Credit Suisse uh, was the best option out there. It's not a great option. He admits that. But he said, when you look at the other options, they're really worse. So I agree with that. Um, and then he comments that uh, the media are try bending over backwards, trying to prevent themselves from using the word bailout. Bailout means, you know, the big guys come in with a lot of money and then you and I pay for it. So it has bad connotation, actually. So uh, he said, but the bottom line is it's a bailout and we are going to pay for it. And then uh, over the weekend, uh, Sunday, they were scrambling, trying to find a way to put together this deal where UBS was going to buy uh, Credit Suisse. And they finally came up with, they made an initial offer and that didn't work. So they came up with a deal to pay $3 billion for a huge bank worth, you know, a lot of money. And the, um, so I did the math on it and I found that the three billion they paid was one percent of what the stock was worth at its high, and that wasn't that long ago. One cent on the dollar. And then I looked at the stock price this morning, and the stock price is down this morning. So they pay one cent on the dollar, and the stock price is down. And so it's just um, there. It's just a mess. And so they're trying to prevent contagion from a run on the banks, people going to their bank and taking money out because you're starting to see multiple banks uh, fail or um, be uh, sitting on the edge and, uh, you know, they're riskier banks and they've made riskier decisions. So maybe they're where they, um, you know, where they are is not a big surprise, but um, there, there can't be a run on the banks or it would be very, very disastrous for our economy and the world economy. So uh, preventing that as much as possible is important. And, but it's, it's just so interesting to me that the whole system is incredibly fragile. It's incredibly leveraged and fragile. So anyway, take a listen to this clip from Mohammed El Arian that was uh, aired this morning. What did you make of this deal? It shows you the complexity of what they had to do. Look, this was not the best solution, but it dominated the other two, which was either nationalization or trying to wind down the bank. But it's full of contradictions. You spoke about 81 versus equity. It's a private sector solution, but has government intervention. You know, it's not clean, but of the available options, this was the best one that, that they could have had. Mohammed, was this a bailout? Yeah, it was a bailout. There's nine billion of um, contingency credit guarantees there. Um, there's a, there's a hundred billion of liquidity support. 
Yeah, it was a bailout. But, you know, bail, bailout, the, the phrase bailout has become such an awful phrase that everybody's avoiding it. They're going out of their way to say it's not a bailout. Um, but then they can't explain why why money is being put to work. Yeah, it is a bailout, and it's a bailout, and you you heard the minister say it's a bailout because they're dealing with a systemically important bank at a time of market turmoil. Now, of course, you're going to always be dealing with a systemically important bank at a time of market turmoil. That, that's by definition what, what happens when you have a systemically important bank um, in trouble, but they just don't want to use that phrase, Lisa. Over the weekend, CNBC's Kelly Evans interviewed Piper Sandler's Michael Kentrowitz, and uh, he talks about the three, he'll talk about three areas um, that are flowing into earnings and the labor market. And he believes, uh, their firm believes, that this will start to show up in mid-2023 in uh, stock prices. Um, significant headwinds, he says, are ahead of us based on what has happened at this point. Take a listen. About the only thing I think I can fault you for is being early at this point, because we all thought perhaps by now the labor market and jobless claims would be cracking. What's really interesting is to see the way that we're starting to see credit markets seize up even without that happening. So uh, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen, uh, as, as you mentioned, we, we have, you know, we've, we've got a lot of problems that are starting to pop up. Uh, we've got knowns and unknowns, and I think there's a lot more. And those three ingredients that you um, that you mentioned, I'll reiterate, which is the Fed raising interest rates, commercial banks tightening lending standards, and an inflation problem. All of the, you know, we've had these three issues for about a year now. It takes time for that to flow all the way through into earnings and the labor market. But obviously, you know, the early signs of that it's having an impact, whether it's through the markets last year and tech stocks getting hit, housing fundamentals uh, in the economy getting hit, and now it's flowing into banks, you know, so it's the rate sensitivity flowing from the earliest um, parts of the economy and financial markets that are susceptible to it. And the end game is ultimately is the employment backdrop. And that's for us when a recession starts uh, and, and looking at the forward looking indicators of employment, that seems to be something that begins in the middle of this year and becomes the dominant risk for equity markets. Right. And, you know, I'm sure you saw this, but Bank of America, they put out a note last night, Subrita, saying uh, we're now in late cycle in the downturn phase. Um, Torsten Slock at Apollo this morning saying he's gone from thinking we're going to have no landing to thinking we're going to have a hard landing. So I, I, the way I see it, a lot of strategists are kind of catching up with your view and with the warnings you've been putting out there for quite some time, tactically yeah. for equity investors. What do they do? I mean, we heard earlier uh, last hour about those who believe a recession's coming and are still positioned for the rebound already, you know, the, the asset classes that are in sectors that are usually outperforming coming out of that event. Um, is that something you think investors can be trying to do right now? Well, you know, it's, it's our job on the sell side as a macro, especially in the macro world, to, to talk about big picture stories um, that are coming up. Uh, and so you know, the, the, the irony, and it's something I often tell clients is, you know, I'm not a big believer that the markets are very forward looking. And I think that's been on full display uh, over the last 12 months and increasingly, you know, over the last 12 days, if, 12, if not 12 hours. Uh, and so if, if you're betting on a recession that's going to happen in six months and position for that, you know, six, six months too early, yeah, you're going to be wrong. And historically, uh, bear markets really start that end up in a recession when unemployment claims start to rise. Next, uh, Brian Sullivan from CNBC interviews Dick Beauvais. Dick Beauvais is known in the industry for being probably the foremost expert on the banking industry. So it's a significant interview. Uh, he says that there is systemic risk, potential risk in the banking system and that there is a, a growing lack of confidence in banks. We saw that last week um, and that it's not over. So take a listen to Brian Sullivan and Dick Beauvais. The government coming out with a nearly unlimited money bailout or rescue, whatever you want to call it, program on Sunday night. Some suggested the SVB fallout was then over. The market clearly disagrees. Is this banking crisis or whatever you want to call it, is it done? Is it near the end? Where are we? 
We're in the middle. Uh, basically, we uh, basically don't think of uh, the 30 billion that went into, uh, you know, First Republic. Think of the 440 billion that the banks uh, put into the Federal Reserve to make sure that the Federal Reserve had the money to bail out any other bank which gets in similar problems. So I think, you know, the fear of uh, a whole bunch of uh, banks failing in the United States is, is not valid at this moment. What you really have to fear is where are we going from here? Because, you know, basically the banking industry in the United States has lost the respect of the public, uh, not just the people who deposit banks, but people who buy bank stocks. Depositors, you know, before this particular uh, crisis occurred, had pulled, you know, basically uh, half a trillion dollars out of the banking industry, out of the deposits in the banking industry. If you look at the, you know, stocks, you know, basically bank stocks sell today at prices which are below where they were five years ago. So what you see is a total lack of confidence in the banking industry by the American mm -hmm. public. And that has to be addressed. And the way it's going to be addressed is with more regulation forcing these banks to sell more common equity, a change in the structure of their balance sheet. There's going to be multiple changes which investors are not going to like at a time well, when the industry's earnings are not going to be that great anyway. Brian Sullivan continues with an interview with uh, Kate Kelly, the New York Times financial reporter, and uh, she points out that there's a lot more damage in front of us, and she says this movie is not over yet. Take a listen to Brian Sullivan and Kate Kelly. Uh, you were there. We were both there. We were there during the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. Some of these, I'm not saying this is that it's not, it's a different beast in some ways. However, when I hear 318 billion basically borrowed by banks this week, these are great financial crisis type numbers. Yeah, Brian, and it's interesting. I mean, earlier this week with the Sunday night announcement and, you know, clearly the failure of three banks, but the apparent stabilization of the system, it felt like we could exhale a little bit. But these cycles are really choppy. And here again, we had a really dramatic day. We started with the 2 a.m. news about Credit Suisse borrowing from the Swiss National Bank. And then we had the first Republic bailout today, which seemed orderly and, as you said, seemed to encourage investors somewhat in the aftermath only to take a step down after their post-market um, news. But, you know, I think there's a lot yet to come. I was talking to a smart macro strategist I know at a money management firm, and she said, look, I'm watching a lot of data here. I'm watching deposit rates. I'm watching credit ratings on the banks. Yeah. I'm looking at money market inflows. I'm looking at, at deposit levels, which are going to be lagging. There's a lot more story here. And although things seem to be working as they should in terms of a, a swift regulatory response and cooperation within the industry, uh, that the, the movie's not nearly over yet. And then finally, I want to play uh, Melissa Lee from CNBC. She uh, interviews Caleb Silver, and he is the chief editor for Investopedia. This is a, um, oh, it's a, it's a site that provides information, uh, definitions, information. So when you search for certain terms, a lot of times uh, Investopedia will come up uh, fairly high in your search. And so what she's asking him is, what are, the, what are the terms, what are the words that people are searching for in Investopedia? And then he gives those and you can listen to that. And then from those word, from those questions that people are searching, they have actually developed what they call uh, an anxiety index. So yes, you're being tracked. Your questions are being tracked and compiled and put into an index and no surprise. Um, so, and then he says uh, the fear index, anxiety index is going off the charts and no surprise. I talked to people and um, it, based on my conversations, I would say a lot of people are certainly very fearful. Um, and I don't want to be one that stokes people's fears or says there's uh, a lot of uh, so much risk that you need to be scared. Um, I definitely try to not do that unless that were the case. I don't think it is the case. So I think uh, the but it does tell me that there is a lot of risk out there and that there is a lot of fear that people have because of um, the collapse banks and how quickly it happened. And that happens because of rising interest rates 
and because banks are so leveraged. So take a listen to Melissa Lee and Caleb Silver. The latest spate of bank failures has an investor anxiety skyrocketing and retail investors are scrambling to understand what is going on. Among the most highly searched questions, according to Investopedia, what is bank failure? What assets are protected in a bank failure? What is too big to fail? You get the picture. For more insight, let's bring in Caleb Silver. He's Investopedia editor in chief, friend of the show. Caleb, always great to see you. They're worried out there. Geez, these, these search queries are, are just a window into their psyche right now. Absolutely, high anxiety. Somebody find Mel Brooks because individual investors have been whipped around this week wondering what is going on. So we measure anxiety through what we call our anxiety index. This is search volume to fear-based terms around the economy, personal finance, and the markets. It is screaming like a toddler who just dropped its ice cream. First shock and then the complete tantrum that follows because they don't know if their money's going to be safe. And then they're watching this big sell-off that happened throughout the week in regional banks, wondering if this is going to contage, be contagious all the way through the markets, a very heady time for investors. Are they daring to go into bank stocks? Yeah, when we look at what not only they're searching for, but what products they're looking for, they're looking at the top bank ETFs, they're looking at the banks that have fallen the most, they're looking at inverse bank ETFs if they want to play it down or play it up. They are trying to get promiscuous on the edge. Not everybody, of course. Most people are saying, what is going on here? I thought we were through this already in 2008. Some of these terms coming back and just the psychological contagion is a lot for people. And that's why you've seen a lot of investors just sitting back and watching this play out this week. So like I always do, I try to say you take all this information about the banking system and you condense it down and you reflect on your own life and say, what can I do about this? here's my situation, what can I do? Now, I know that, you know, when I speak to a broad public audience, uh, people are in different situations. So I don't want to generalize too much, but what I thought I would do would be to share with you what I have done. So the, there are four different areas where, that, where I have my money, and I'll go through these and explain how they work and what's involved in each one. First of all, the bank. This is not a picture of my bank. <laughs> I have a uh, small uh, to medium-sized Montana bank, and it doesn't look like this. But uh, the uh, so the, start with the bank. There are ways you can you have money in the bank. There's ways you can reduce your risk in the bank. Uh, this is what I have done. Uh, first of all, let me begin by saying we're in a fractional banking system, fa fractional reserve banking system. And what that means is that uh, when you put money in the bank, they go invest approximately 90% of that money. And they have 10% of your money available. So in other words, they are leveraged about 10 to 1. Or you could say if you put $1,000 in, they go and invest 9000 so it's, it, it's a very leveraged system. So it cannot withstand a lot of people wanting to get their money uh, out of the bank because it's not available. It's invested in mortgages and other assets. A, a lot of them are mortgages. And so th that money is not liquid. So it's very important that in, in banks that they not have a run on the bank, that there not be uh, people rushing to get their money out so the, the things that I look for in my bank, and this is what I've done, I evaluate the management, how well the, I perceive that the bank is being run. I'm not privy to their private conversations, but my perception of that, really looking at management and the people. Secondly, I look at their ratings, but I go beyond the ratings and then I look at uh, what, are the, what, are the what is the makeup of the various factors that go into that rating. So as long as a bank is top rated, that's good, but you have to be careful because Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank both had top ratings, not the highest. They had a B rating, which is considered very good. And so if you look just at the ratings, you might have thought your money would have been safe there. So you have to look behind the scenes. And I'll go through that uh, coming up after the slide. I'll, I'll show you um, how I do that, and I'll make that available to you um, if you want it uh, for your bank. 
And finally, the thing that I've done uh, practically is I have limited my deposits. So I keep enough to pay my bills. This is personal and business. I keep enough to pay my bills plus a cushion. That's it. So with the fact that I'm looking at a bank that I'm comfortable with, I'm comfortable with ratings, I'm looking at their management, and I limit my money. That way, I, I really, truly don't worry about it. If my bank went under tomorrow, I wouldn't like that, but it's not going to devastate me. So, um, and it would not create the level of fear in me that you see that's being created in some people because of the current bank situation. The second thing that I do is that over time, I have taken cash out of the bank. Um, I won't say I do it systematically, but I've done it uh, periodically over uh, a fair period of time. And I put that cash, I do it in $20 bills, I put that cash in an offsite location. I don't keep it in my house and I certainly don't put it in the bank. And because I, I think it's uh, helpful to have money, uh, actual money out of the system. And so this is getting uh, money out of the system and in physical um, cash. I learned this idea from uh, reading Jim Rickard's book, The Death of Money. And in there, he gives practical ideas. And uh, that was one of the ideas that I picked up there. And since I've done that, I don't say that to very many people actually, but when I have said it, uh, I've, I'm surprised at the number of people that say I do the same thing. So that would be one way. That's another bucket. So you've got one bucket in the bank, which is hopefully a good bank and limited. The second bucket is physical cash, put in an offsite location or wherever you choose to put it. Uh, that is separate from the bank and not put in the bank. And by the way, when I mention something like this, it reminds me, I don't want to forget to say this, is that uh, safe deposit boxes are not safe. They should call them unsafe deposit boxes because they are not insured all of the contents in the safe deposit box. I don't care how many doors in the vault you've got to go through to get in, that those contents are not insured and the government has raided safe deposit boxes before. So I'm not saying they're gonna raid yours or raid your bank. I'm just saying uh, it's, not, it's not as safe as you think it is. So I, at least it's, <laughs> it's not as safe as I thought it was. So some time ago I got out of that and I don't have any money in safe deposit boxes. And particularly when you look at where things are right now with uh, the upside down nature of banks and being locked out and so forth. I don't, I just wouldn't do that. Um, and then thirdly, uh, I have, and this goes over a long period of time. This is over in the last 30, 35 years, I have uh, been buying silver. So I, um, and I put that in an offsite location, not at my house and of course not at the bank. Um, and I'm gonna go through that in a couple of slides and show you ways to uh, get physical silver as inexpensively as possible and in you know what denomination what uh, denominations and what uh, type of silver uh, it the, <laughs> there's two or three forks in the road when you go down the road of silver so um, I'll, I'll go into that more but uh, that so now I've and I have two insurance policies one insurance policy is the physical cash so that protects me from digital risk in banks and I have money to uh, operate with. And then secondly, uh, my other insurance policy is against the value of the dollar declining, which is in silver. So over time, over a long period of time, uh, not this day, this week, whatever, but over a long period of time, silver has held its value and it goes back to ancient Egypt, uh, you know, thousands of years and um, as a method of currency and I hope I don't have to use my insurance policy. I hope I don't have to use either one of them, but I have them in, the, in case of various kinds of risk that could, could occur. Um, financial advisors um, have been taught to downplay traditional financial advisors, uh, have been taught to downplay the use of gold and silver. And they will say things like, that's a terrible investment, or it doesn't pay dividends or things like that. Uh, that's, 
what it, now that I'm inside the industry and I am a financial advisor, um, I know I can I know people who are in the industry, and I, they will say to me privately, they won't say publicly, but they will say privately that they can't make a commission or charge a fee on it. So that's the real reason they say that is that they want as many assets as they can so they can get a commission or charge a fee. Um, I'm just telling you what I've been told. So the, um, and then you look at people like Dave Ramsey. Uh, he is like the worst. He, he has horrible, horrible investment advice. Uh, he's right up there with Jim Cramer. And uh, he, he's good with budgets and he's good with debt and he is knowledgeable about real estate. But when you get into investing uh, outside of real estate, um, the advice he gives and is terrible. What he does actually, when you contact him, the, if you fill out a form online, you wanna go to an endorsed local provider. <laughs> that endorsed means I approve of them. No, it's not how it works. What he does when you get that form, he sells your name to three advisors and charges them $180 each. So there, he's making over $500 the minute you fill out that form by selling it to somebody who is going to try to sell you some investments and to teach you to stay away from silver. That is horrible. Friend of mine, uh, Paul Merriman uh, from Seattle, I've known many, many years, and he since uh, sold his firm, but he did a weekly broadcast for many years in Seattle. And uh, he had, Paul had this uh, phrase, which I, I agree with, and I think it fits the advice that Dave Ramsey gives on investments, particularly on silver or gold and silver. And that is, Paul would call that an example of financial pornography. And I think that fits. Uh, horrible advice. I've seen the output of uh, the advisors and uh, every one of them will tell you not to buy silver. So I disagree. Um, and Jim Cramer is not far behind, but he's, he's got another set of problems. But uh, I think the two of them are way up there. The final thing, my custodian is TD Ameritrade, and uh, that's the platform I do my investing on. And uh, so what I've done is to set up a taxable account uh, to put money into that um, where I can uh, use that as liquid cash. And I like that because T uh, custodians like TD Ameritrade I've never known of a custodian that's ever gone bankrupt, but there is a long string, a long, long string of banks that have gone bankrupt. And so and I like that security that, and the reason for that is they're not leveraged. They're not out making loans and, and leveraging your money 10 to one. So uh, that's one reason. Uh, secondly, the, they are insured by SIPC, which is different than FDIC. And the way that works is, without getting too far in the weeds, they insure each account up to $500,000. Uh, $500, and 250000 of that is on the cash portion of the account. So if you have, and this type of account. So if, for example, if you have an IRA, a Roth IRA, an individual account, a joint account, a, a SEP IRA account, et cetera, you could go up to $500,000 per account and it would be insured. And there's never been a custodian go out of business. So I feel very safe in having money there and I have the ability to write checks on it. Now I don't use it to pay bills with or that sort of thing, but I literally can write checks and uh, I've done that and they work just like a regular check. Um, so I still use my bank for the writing of checks and day-to-day -day purposes. So those are the four buckets that I put money into. And so each one has got different kinds of risk uh, and each one has different kinds of uh, safety. Um, so under various scenarios, uh, I feel like that I will um, be protected 
as much as possible, not perfectly. Um, but there's a lot of scenarios, depending on what happens with you know currency and so forth, uh, a lot of scenarios that uh, this will give me a measure of protection. So I share that just to tell you what I do. What you do is up to you, and you have to assess the risk for yourself. Um, but I think this would help de-risk situations. It certainly does for me, uh, rather than just put all of my money in the bank. Next, what is your bank's rating? Now, like I said, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank both had B ratings. And I believe the uh, First Republic had a uh, B minus rating. Those are not bad ratings. Even a B minus is not a bad rating. The ratings go from A to F, six ratings, A, B, C, D, E, and F. So if you're in the second category, that is not bad. Um, many banks are in the B category. Uh, to be an A would be excellent, but A or B are considered excellent. So, but you have to go beyond that. So the areas to consider beyond the rating itself is the, how capitalized is the bank, the asset quality, in other words, how many bad loans do they have, uh, profitability, liquidity, and stability. So uh, if you want that on your bank, give me a call. I will be glad to give you that information. And uh, if you want, I can compare your bank to other banks. I can even tell you the top rated banks in your area and how they score in these various areas. So. Uh, it might be helpful to you now. I know a lot of people watch the show, so if you, um, if I don't get right back to you, give me a little bit of time. I'll get through it as quickly as I can and be able to share with you information on your bank if that's of interest to you. This last week, I uh, talked with my son, Preston, and he's in the precious metal business, and he and I had this conversation about, because I was asking him some questions like, okay, what is uh, silver selling for now? And what types of silver and at what quantities? So we got to do a lot of discussion. And I, I know a fair amount about it. I'm not an expert, but I know a fair amount. And as a consumer, and uh, he was telling me things I did not know. And so I wrote him down and I thought, I need to cover this and share it with you because I will bet you, you don't know this. And the reason I say that, because it's, it's an unregulated industry. If you call somebody, uh, good luck getting somebody who's credible out there. There are some who are and some who are not. And then uh, most of them are trying to sell you something. So I knew that I could trust Preston, you know, implicitly to give me accurate information and complete information. So I'm passing on to you what I think is generally not available. Uh, you can look it up if you want, but uh, you have to be careful because there's, it's being an unregulated industry, there's um, definitely a credible information and there's some that is not as credible. So what I learned was that this is a container, it's a container of mine, a uh, container of silver. It has 20 ounces of silver in it. And I've taken a few out, so it's not quite 20. But they, when you buy them, there's 20. And I said to Preston, I said, okay, what does a container of silver, what, do, what does that cost? Well, that's not a simple answer. <laughs> so, okay, what is it? So if you have generic silver, which I have, generic silver, uh, that with a stamp on it, it's not legal tender, I... Uh, that is called generic silver or rounds or bullion. Uh, and if you get that, you can get that in just one container. You can buy a container on to, based on today's prices when I just looked for $516. So if you don't own any, and I'm just gonna say that you're a person of average means, uh, you may say, oh, I could afford $516. Okay, you can buy one of these and with, with generic silver in it, which is all I have is generic silver. And that's $3.25 over spot. Now, when I looked, the spot price was $22.58. So $22.58 plus $3.25 times 20, 
and that would get you a container. That's just an example. The other, the next step up, when you go beyond generic, then you get into uh, mints from countries. In our mint, it's a Silver Eagle. Uh, I'll come back to that. Canada has a, the maple leaf. Australia, the kangaroo. The, uh, England has the Britannia. And each of those is, each one is kind of like our Silver Eagle, except they're not as expensive as a Silver Eagle. So if you went to the Canadian Maple Leaf, for example, a container is $541, $4.50 over spot. The thing about Canadian, he told me, I didn't know this, the Canadian Maple Leafs, and also it's true of the Australian Kangaroo, it, they're still just, you know, an ounce and it's pure silver, except they're not quite pure silver. Everything from the U.S., including Silver Eagles, and the Britannia are 99.9% .9 silver, but the maple leaf and the kangaroo are 99.99% .99 silver, four nines instead of three. You may say, well, that's just a tiny, tiny difference. True, it is. But they are considered a little bit more pure. And so the maple leaves are 450 over and I think the kangaroos are as well, but their uh, kangaroos are a little bit harder for them to get right now. So finally, you go to the to the all the way to the silver eagle. Now, silver eagle in the U.S. is not legal tender, but it it's people want it. So the if you have them, I don't. But if you want, you pay today. You pay ten dollars over spot. So if it's twenty two fifty eight. You're going to pay thirty-two fifty-eight approximately for for that container, and that comes out to six hundred and fifty-one dollars. Um, then he said, "Dad, if you think that's interesting, what you might do this would maybe be for someone who had a little bit more money." He said, "Okay, you could buy a monster box. I've, I literally have never heard that term." I've been around silver. I've never thought of a monster box. So that's what I'm showing here is a monster box that has 500 ounces of silver in it. Okay, that's fine. So I said, what would, if I just bought that as generic, what would that cost me? He said, $2.70 over spot. So that price of $3.25 came down to $2.70. That would be the cheapest way to buy silver if you could afford to one go generic and two go with a monster box, two dollars and seventy cents over. And the reason that kind of rang in my mind was I thought it wasn't that long ago, sometime last year, that I was hearing five dollars over, and the the markup has come down to you know, let's say 325 all the way down to 270. So it's pretty interesting. What that amounts to for 500 is $12,640. He says, that's, that's reasonable. And 500 maple leaves, 13165 And that 450 price comes down to 375 So then I said, okay, so do you get that markup? Does your company get that? He said, no, we don't. He said, we buy it probably about a dollar per ounce below what we sell it for. So if something's selling for $450, we're probably paying about $350 for that. If it's $270, we're probably paying about $170 over spot to get that. He said, Dad, we work on very thin margins. So I didn't know that. I was assuming all of that markup went to the retailer, but it doesn't. And then, this was interesting also, he said, if you get a monster box, it comes and it is sealed. It's sealed at the mint. And if you leave it sealed and you sell it back, you will get two premiums when you sell it back. If you're, you know, looking at it that way, uh, you could you get a premium because it's 500, and then you get a premium because it's sealed. So you get a premium on top of a premium. So if you want to, he said, just keep it sealed and it comes directly from the mint and it's clear to everyone that it did come from the mint. And, um, but if you break the seal, you lose that second discount. So I thought that was very interesting and uh, helpful. And 
Um, so like I said, I look at all of this as an insurance policy. I don't count how much I have. I don't look at the price today or factor it into what I'm worth or anything. I don't do that. It's just I don't care if the price goes up or down. It's an insurance policy. If I ever need it, um, that backs up the uh, declining value of the dollar. And of course, that has declined over time. So uh, thank you for watching. Again, if you're interested in that bank uh, uh, rating and uh, measurements, uh, feel free to reach out at, at my phone number here and I'll uh, have that discussion with you and I will get back to you as quickly as possible. If you leave comments, I'll try to respond to them as quickly as I can. Thank you.